My name is Dr. Donovan, and in this video, we're going to be covering key things you need to know about achalasia, a rare disorder in which damaged nerves in your esophagus, which you might know as your food pipe, prevent it from working as it should. In this video, we're going to cover all of the following topics, which are split into chapters and time stamped to help you navigate your way around the video. So, first of all, what is achalasia? Well, as I mentioned, it's a rare disorder in which your esophagus is unable to move food and liquids down into your stomach. Now, your esophagus is the muscular tube that transports food from your mouth to your stomach, which you can see on screen now. You might know this as your food pipe. At the point where the esophagus meets the stomach, there is a muscular ring called the lower esophageal sphincter, or LES. Now, under normal conditions, this muscle relaxes, allowing the food to enter your stomach and then closes to prevent stomach content, like acid, from backing up into your esophagus. But if you have achalasia, the ring of muscle doesn't relax. This prevents food from moving into your stomach, so it gets stuck in the food pipe, or the esophagus. Now, as I mentioned, achalasia is actually a relatively rare condition, only affecting around one in every 100,000 people. It most commonly affects adults aged 25 to 60, but it can occur in children as well, and men and women seem to be equally affected. So now let's briefly discuss what actually causes achalasia. Well, the exact cause of achalasia isn't fully known. One theory is that it's an autoimmune disease where your body attacks itself, and that's triggered by a virus. In other situations, a rare form of achalasia might be inherited, meaning that genetics could be at play. But either way, further research into the causes of achalasia is needed. So now let's discuss some of the potential symptoms of achalasia. Well, the first thing to mention is that in general, achalasia symptoms develop slowly with symptoms lasting for months or perhaps even years. Now, the most common early symptom is trouble or difficulty swallowing, which medically is termed dysphagia. Now, because of this, people with achalasia often mention that they experience regurgitation of undigested food. So it feels like food is stuck in the food pipe and it might even be coming back up into their mouth. Other people experience chest pain that comes and goes. They might experience heartburn, a cough, particularly at night, and weight loss secondary to difficulty eating. However, this is a late symptom. Now, what are the complications of achalasia? Now, one of the complications is that food can back up the esophagus and actually go down the windpipe. Now, this can be a problem because this leads to the lungs and it could lead to pneumonia, which is a severe lung infection. The other thing to note is that achalasia actually increases your risk of esophageal cancer. Now, how is achalasia diagnosed? Well, there are three tests that are commonly used to diagnose achalasia, and we'll just discuss these now. The first is something called a barium swallow. Now, for this test, you're going to swallow a barium preparation, which can be liquid or another form, and it moves through your esophagus, and this movement is evaluated using x-rays. Now, the barium swallow will typically show a narrowing of the esophagus at the sphincter, and you can see an example of this on screen now. Now, the next test is an upper endoscopy. In this test, a flexible, narrow tube with a little camera on it called an endoscope is passed down your esophagus. The camera projects images of the inside of your esophagus onto a screen for the doctor to evaluate. Now, this test is really helpful at ruling out cancerous lesions as well as assessing for achalasia. And finally, there's a test called manometry. Now, this is considered the best or what we call gold standard test for diagnosing achalasia. Now, this test measures the timing and the strength of your esophageal muscle contractions as well as the relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter. So now let's move on briefly and discuss treatment. Several treatments are available for achalasia, including both non-surgical as well as surgical options. Either way, the goal of treatment is to relieve your symptoms by relaxing that muscular ring called the lower esophageal sphincter and allowing food to properly pass into your stomach. Now, it's important that you discuss all of the potential treatment options with your health provider, including both the pros and cons, so that you can decide the best treatment based on the severity of your condition as well as your own preferences. So let's first of all discuss some of the non-surgical options. Well, the first is something called balloon dilatation. In this non-surgical procedure, you'll be put under light sedation whilst a specifically designed balloon is inserted through that muscular ring called the lower esophageal sphincter, and then it's inflated. Now, the procedure aims to relax the muscle sphincter, which then allows food to enter your stomach. Now, balloon dilation is usually the first treatment option in people whom surgery fails, and it can improve symptoms 
in between 50 and up to 90% of patients. Now you might have to undergo several dilation treatments to relieve your symptoms and then every few years to maintain relief. Now if you're not a candidate for this procedure or surgery or you choose not to undergo these procedures, you might benefit from Botox or botulinum toxin injections. Now when botulinum toxin is injected into muscles, in very small quantities, it can help relax the muscles, helping food to pass through into the stomach. Now, Botox injection successfully relaxes spastic esophageal sphincter muscles in up to 35% of people with achalasia, but the injections need to be repeated every six to 12 months to maintain the symptom relief. Now, there are other medications available that can help relax the spastic esophageal muscles by lowering the sphincter pressure. And often these treatments, however, are less effective than surgery or the balloon dilation and only provide short-term relief of the symptoms. They're not really a long-term option. On the other hand, we can discuss some of the surgical options that are available. Now, the surgery that's used to treat achalasia is called laparoscopic esophagomyotomy or laparoscopic helimyotomy. Now, in this surgery, a thin telescopic-like instrument called an endoscope is inserted through a small incision. The endoscope is connected to a really tiny camera and the muscle fibers of that muscular ring, the LES, are cut. Now, the addition of another procedure called a partial fundoplication can help prevent gastroesophageal reflux where the acid comes up the food pipe. And this is something that can be a side effect of the helomyotomy procedure. Now, helomyotomy is effective in 76 to 100% of people with achalasia, but keep in mind that up to 15% of people do experience these reflux symptoms after surgery. Another option is peroral endoscopic myotomy, or POEM, and that's a minimally invasive alternative to the laparoscopic helomyotomy. Now, in this procedure, muscles on the side of the esophagus, the lower esophageal sphincter, and the upper part of the stomach are cut with a knife. Now, the cuts in these areas loosen the muscles, and it allows the esophagus to empty like it normally should, passing food down into your stomach. Finally, there is the option for removal of the esophagus completely if other options fail or they're not suitable. This is known as an esophagectomy, but this is the last resort treatment. So what are the complications of some of these treatments for achalasia? Well, like any treatment option, there can actually be complications of the treatments themselves. So these can include creation of a hole in the esophagus, lack of success and return of the symptoms, gastroesophageal reflux, which is where you get the heartburn symptoms or bloating. In terms of post-treatment follow-up, well, long-term follow-up is needed regardless of what treatment you're going to receive. And this is because treatments don't necessarily cure achalasia or halt its progression, but instead they tend to just help with symptoms and quality of life. And because of this, symptoms can return. Now your healthcare provider is going to want to see if your esophagus is adequately allowing food to enter your stomach and to check for the gastroesophageal reflux or the acid coming back up into the esophagus, which would need to be treated because the long-term reflux can be linked to esophageal cancer. If you think about it like this, you have the esophagus and the lining of the esophagus. And if acid keeps washing back up that, it can cause dysplasia of the cells. Now, the final question is, is achalasia serious? Well, the answer is yes, it can be, especially if it goes untreated. If you've got achalasia, you'll gradually experience increased trouble eating solid foods as well as drinking liquids. You might also notice considerable weight loss and malnutrition if you don't get it treated. Now, like I've mentioned several times before in this video, people with achalasia also have a small increased risk of developing esophageal cancer, particularly if the condition has been present for a long time and it's not treated. Because of this, your healthcare provider might recommend regular screenings of your esophagus to catch cancer early if it were to develop. Finally, what are my top tips if you've been diagnosed with or treated for achalasia? Well, first you need to understand that achalasia is a lifelong condition. You also need to try to have realistic expectations about the outcomes of different treatment procedures. And again, I would talk about these with your own doctor. Now, no treatment cures achalasia, so you need to ask your healthcare provider to discuss all of the treatment options and their success rates for controlling symptoms, as well as the need for things like repeat procedures and the frequency of these, as well as the risks and benefits. Now, there are some helpful lifestyle changes that you can make. So things like cutting your food up into small bite-sized pieces, as well as making sure you eat in an upright position, and that will allow gravity to help food move through the esophagus. 
It's also important never to lay flat because this is going to increase your risk of aspirating your food into your lungs or the food going down the windpipe instead of the food pipe. Instead, you should sleep with your head elevated or propped up on a few pillows. And finally, avoid eating solid foods at or around bedtime.